Okay, uh, as uh, you mentioned, I'm a professor of philosophy at Loyola Marymount University, and I've uh, thought uh, about this issue before, um, and so I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully a lively discussion. Um, and so let me begin by just saying that I think this issue, in order to think about it fruitfully, we need to first begin with the distinction between the act and the agent. And so what I mean by that is it's possible for uh, someone to do an act that is morally impermissible, and yet for that agent to still be a morally good person. So in this whole discussion, at least for my part, I'm not making any judgment whatsoever about the people who get abortions or the people who support abortion. I'm not making any judgment about their character. I believe that someone might get an abortion or someone might support abortion in good faith. Now, I think it, when we carefully think about the issue that the it turns out to be the case that abortion actually is not morally permissible, but I recognize that people of goodwill and people of good faith uh, can and do see things differently than I do. So let me put that aside. I'm not making any judgments at all about people's character, to look down on them, to put them down, or anything like that. Um, now, why a, do I have the pro-life uh, point of view? Well, I think to, to think about the question properly, we need to start off with three fundamental questions. The first is, is this individual alive? The second is, is this individual a human being? And the third is, does this individual have a right to live? Or is it morally permissible to kill this individual? And by this individual, what I mean is the human fetus. So first, let's think about the question, is this individual alive? I want to emphasize here that answering this question and also the question of whether this individual is human has nothing whatsoever to do with faith, with religion, with theology, with the Bible, with Jesus, etc. A reasonable person, a person of goodwill, who's an atheist, can come to all the same conclusions that I'm going to come to in my part of the discussion. So this is not at all dependent upon religion or revelation or theistic belief or anything of the sort. So to the first question, is this individual alive? I want to appeal to science. If we look at the embryology textbook called The Developing Human in its 10th edition, we find these quotations, human life begins at fertilization. This marks the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. The zygote is the beginning of a new human being that is an embryo. Now, why do scientists think that the, this individual is a living being? Well, there's a number of reasons. One is that it grows proportionally. Secondly, it assimilates nutrition. Third, it has functioning parts that exhibit a unity and function together for the good of the whole. Uh, it also responds to its environment and adapts to its environment. The human fetus is not a part of another human being. It is its own individual, unique, whole, living human being itself. Unlike, say, sperm or unlike an egg, which are parts of other human beings, the human embryo and the human fetus are distinct organisms. It has a individual principle of operation by which it does the things that it does. So it would be an error to call the fetus a clump of, a clump of cells. At least it's an error in the sense that if you call the fetus a clump of cells, you might as well call you or me a clump, clump of cells. The fetus is not a clump of cells. The fetus is a organism. So this is shown in another way too. I'd like to appeal here to the science section of the Telegraph and the headline on May 4th, 2016 from the science editor was this, human embryos kept alive in lab for unprecedented 13 days so scientists can watch. Now, if human embryos can be kept alive, that means that human embryos are alive. It's impossible to keep something alive unless that thing first is alive. So all available scientific evidence confirms that the human embryo, the human fetus, is a living thing, a living organism. So now onto the second question. Is this individual a human being? Well, this individual has a human mother and a human father. This individual has human blood, often of a different blood type than the parents. 
This individual is constituted by human tissue. This individual has human DNA. This individual is on a path of human development. This is a human embryo. This is a human fetus. This is not a dog embryo. This is not a dog fetus. This is not a cat fetus. In fact, it is scientifically impossible for two human beings to get together and do a reproductive kind of act and have the result of that be an individual of a different species, right? Uh, a man and a woman who do reproductive acts cannot produce a goat, a dog, a fish, or any other kind of individual being. Two human beings doing a human reproductive act using their reproductive organs can only reproduce another human being. And in fact, both of these points, that this is a living individual and that this is a living individual human being are admitted by almost all defenders, in philosophy at least, of abortion and infanticide. Almost all of them do admit that this is an individual living being, and almost all of them do admit that this is a human being. So where does the disagreement really begin? If we accept all the science, the individual, uh, the disagreements begin with the third question, is it wrong to kill this individual? And so I want to give um, six different arguments that it is wrong to kill this individual. The first argument appeals to human rights. I believe, and the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights declares, that all human beings have human rights. And the most basic of human rights is the right to live. That is, the right not to be intentionally killed by others. So the human embryo, the human fetus, the human newborn, the human child, and the human adult are all human beings. Now, if you put these premises together, you have the conclusion that the human embryo, the human fetus, and the human newborn all have human rights, including the right not to be intentionally killed. Now, it's never permissible, at least on my view, to violate someone's basic human rights. Let me say that again. It is never permissible, in my view, to violate someone's basic human rights. It's wrong if a government tortures and kills an innocent person, even if they think it's going to serve somehow the greater good. Now, abortion violates the basic human rights of the human embryo and the human fetus by intentionally killing the human fetus and therefore violating its right to life, which is the right not to be intentionally killed. If we put these premises together, the conclusion follows that abortion is never morally permissible. Now, what if the human fetus is not a person? Well, we can consider the wrongfulness of abortion from another perspective. What makes it wrong to kill you or me? Well, if you kill you or me, it doesn't take away our past. I still have being a kindergartner and you, you do too. But if someone kills you or me, what happens is it takes away my chance for a valuable future. And that is true of killing you or me. And that is also true of killing a human newborn. If you kill a human newborn, it takes away that newborn's chance for a valuable future. And the same thing's true of killing a fetus or killing a human embryo. They too, if they're killed, are deprived of their chance for a valuable future. So note in this argument, I am not claiming anything for or against personhood of a fetus. So it's never morally permissible to deprive individuals of a chance for a future like ours. And abortion, as well as infanticide, is an action that deprives individuals of a chance for a future like ours. Therefore, abortion is never a morally permissible choice. Uh, here's a third argument. It begins with fetal alcohol syndrome. It seems to me that it's wrong to intentionally cause fetal alcohol syndrome in another. Fetal alcohol syndrome, if you're not aware of what it is, causes very serious physical deformities, very serious mental health deformities. It causes mental disability. And some of the poor children who have suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome can't even count or read a clock in seventh grade. It's a very serious condition. Secondly, if it's wrong to impair an individual to a particular degree, then other things being equal, it's wrong to impair that individual to a greater degree. In other words, if it's wrong for me to poke out your eye and make you partially blind, it's also wrong for me to poke out both of your eyes and make you totally blind. If it's wrong for me to cut off your hand and deprive you of your hand, it's also wrong for me to cut off your whole arm and deprive you not only of your hand, but of your whole arm. So killing someone is inflicting upon them a greater impairment than fetal alcohol syndrome. Killing someone results in that individual's total physical destruction, whereas fetal alcohol syndrome only brings partial physical deformities. 
If you kill someone, you've taken away any chance they have of social life, whereas fetal alcohol syndrome just impairs social life. If you kill someone, you've taken away entirely their mental abilities, whereas fetal alcohol syndrome only partially takes away mental abilities. If you kill someone, they're unable to do anything whatsoever. But if you inflict fetal alcohol syndrome on someone, then they may be able to do some things, like, you know, count once they're over age uh, grade seven. So uh, for CRA, it's worse to kill someone than to impair that person to a lesser degree. So it's never morally permissible to knowingly and willingly give someone fetal alcohol syndrome. And if it's never morally permissible to knowingly and willingly give fetal alcohol syndrome to someone, then other things being equal, it's never morally permissible to bring about a greater harm to that individual, that is killing them. Therefore, it is never morally permissible to knowingly and willingly authorize someone to kill that individual that is the prenatal human being. A fourth argument has to do with social justice. It's never morally permissible to act against social justice, that is to deny protection to or to intentionally harm the most vulnerable, helpless, and disadvantaged human beings. But the newborn and the prenatal human being are among the most vulnerable, the most helpless, and the most disadvantaged of human beings. That is to say, a newborn baby and a fetus is unable to voice their protest at being killed. They're unable to defend themselves in any physical way. They're unable to mobilize others to support their cause. So if anyone's a vulnerable human being, it seems to me a newborn baby and a human being in utero both count as vulnerable human beings. So it's never morally permissible to act against social justice but to deny protection and or to harm newborns or prenatal human beings is to act against social justice. Abortion is an act against social justice because it denies protection and harms the prenatal human being. And therefore, abortion is never morally permissible. A fifth argument that I want to provide is this. Actions that intentionally kill innocent human beings are never morally permissible. And the act of abortion does intentionally kill innocent human beings. The abortionist aims at ending the life of the human being prior to birth. And that's why it's called a botched abortion. If an abortionist attempts to give, uh, attempts to perform an abortion and the fetus is born alive, that's a, not a successful abortion. And so why do we call it a botched or unsuccessful abortion? Well, because the abortionist is aiming at not delivering a healthy baby, but at ending the life of the prenatal human being. A sixth argument appeals to the sad history of exclusion that unfortunately has been part of our society for many centuries. When we think about racism, what we see is one race saying that another race doesn't count as fully human, doesn't count as having basic dignity, doesn't count as having basic rights. When we look at sexism in its strongest form, we see that men say, well, women are misbegotten men. They're not fully human. They don't really count. They don't have full human rights. When we look at religious exploitation, we see one religion saying, oh, you, if you're in a, of a different religion, you don't have basic rights and you don't count. If we look at European exploitation of native peoples, we see again the same sorry pattern where they say, well, you're different from us and therefore we don't have to respect you. And finally, in slavery, we see the same terrible pattern where the slave owner says, yes, of course, I deserve basic rights and protections. But if you're the slave, you have none of those things. Now, every time that we've divided the human family into two groups, those that are like us, that have basic rights and deserve protection and deserve respect, and those that are different from us, that don't deserve respect, that don't deserve protection, every single time we've ever made this division in the human family, we look back on it and say that was a horrible mistake. That was a moral tragedy. So history shows it's never morally permissible to divide human beings into those human beings who have basic rights and those human beings who do not have basic rights. To deny basic rights to newborns, prenatal human beings, is to, to divide human beings into those human beings who have basic rights and those human beings who do not. So it's never, never morally permissible to deny basic human rights to newborns or prenatal human beings. So if it's never morally permissible to deny basic rights to newborns or prenatal human beings, uh, then we have the premise that to get an abortion is to deny by your deeds 
the basic human rights of prenatal human beings by killing them. And so the conclusion would follow that it never is morally permissible to get an abortion. So what I try to do is basically uh, bring forward a case against the choice of abortion. I try to bring forward a case that the choice of abortion is never morally permissible. And I made remarks that talked about the fact that science shows that the human fetus is a living organism, the fact that science shows that this living organism is a human being, that it has human parents, it has human DNA, it has human blood, it can't be a goat, a dog, a fish, or anything else. And then I gave six arguments why, all, why we should respect and protect the life of these human beings. I gave the human rights argument, I gave the future like ours argument, I gave the fetal alcohol syndrome argument, I gave the social justice argument, I gave the harming the innocent argument, and finally, I made an argument from the history of exclusion, that every single time we've ever divided the human family into those who have basic rights and those that don't, we've made a horrible mistake. And I'm very afraid that we are continuing that horrible mistake now by denying basic rights to our brothers and sisters prior to their birth. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. K Kayser. Uh, so I thought you were going to do your...